Um, so, yeah, my talk is about some of the work that I did for my PhD. So that was in San Diego at Scripps Oceanography. Um, and this is just a little picture of one of the places that I went to uh, on field work. Um, and I just thought I'd put this here to sort of sell Paleomag a bit. It's good to do. You get to go to cool places. Um, so the Earth's magnetic field is generated by uh, currents um, caused by convective motion in Earth's outer core, um, as you can see in this diagram here. And because of that, the field is constantly changing. Um, so this is a plot whose numbers you won't be able to see that tracks the Earth's magnetic field over the last 200 years, or the, sorry, the magnetic North Pole location over the last 200 years. And this point here is in 1831, and this one here is 1994, and then this one here is in 2019. And you can see that the motion of Earth's magnetic North Pole has been accelerating rapidly. And so these changes are actually faster than people had predicted from models. And so it's quite important to know how the Earth's magnetic field can change. Um, in the past, uh, we can look and see how it's changed in the past to see how it may change in the future. And we have some records of this. So throughout the 20th century, we have records from geomagnetic observatories around Earth. And then going further back in time, we have some more direct records, which were being made by people on ships who wanted to know what direction they were going in. Um, and so we sort of have global records that go back to about 1600. And then in certain places, we have records going back further than that. Um, but in terms of direct records, that's sort of where things stop. So how can we look at the Earth's magnetic field over longer time scales? So to do this, we use paleomagnetism and archaeomagnetism. So when something cools in a magnetic field, it can gain a magnetization which records that field. And we can use this information in both rocks and archaeological materials um, to obtain the strength of the field, known as the paleointensity, as well as the direction of the field in, that, in the past, in archaeological or geological time. So I think always it's good to have a bit of a motivation for why people do paleomag or archaeomag. So a big one is dating of materials. So um, I think quite a lot of people might know about magnetostratigraphy, um, which is using the polarity of the field to date. Uh, sediments most frequently. Um, but also you can use uh, the strength of the field. And this is sort of, well, actually, this is the declination of the field, so this is the direction. But you can use all the components of the field. If you have a curve built up of what the field was doing in the past through archaeomag or paleomag, you can then use this in a way kind of like uh, carbon dating does, where you can match an observed value to that curve and get a probability distribution of uh, the age of something. Um, this is just an example from archaeomagnetism. Uh, other big questions that uh, paleomagnetism can sort of answer are things about the sort of thermal history of the Earth back in deep time. So things about, you know, when did the inner core form? When did plate tectonics start? And these sort of papers that have been, uh, well, actually the lab at Liverpool here has worked quite a bit on this problem of when the inner core formed. Um, and then finally, you can use the direction of the field to find where a continent was on Earth, at least in terms of its latitude, in the past. Um, and this is something that is done quite frequently. So sort of a big assumption of paleomagnetism, especially that last thing where a continent was in the past, is that the Earth's magnetic field behaves like a bar magnet, which is centered at the spin axis of the Earth. And this is known as a geocentric axial dipole, because the field is dipolar, it has two poles, and those are centers at the spin axis. Um, and sort of, if you look at global compilations of directions, what you see is that the direction of the Earth's magnetic field is horizontal, uh, at uh, the sort of at the equator and then vertical at the poles. And so you get a distribution that looks like this and it agrees fairly well with a GAD field. But if you look at the global distribution of paleo intensities, uh, the picture is rather different to so the field strength. So, so this plot here is a plot of the expected field strengths that would be given by a geocentric axial dipole for paleo intensities at different latitudes. So the red line and the blue line are correspond to a, a dipolar field, the strength of today's field strength. 
and a dipolar field half of today's field strength. The distributions here, uh, shown in blue, are observed paleointensities or estimated paleointensities uh, in a global database. Um, so where these are widest, that means there are more, pa or more paleointensity uh, results at that value. Um, and then the yellow stars are the averages. And so on average, you would expect that the yellow stars would correspond to one of these lines if the Earth's magnetic field is dipolar. However, it doesn't. So you can see here that at these low northern latitudes, you end up with uh, yellow stars that sort of correspond more closely to today's field. And then if you look in the sort of southern hemisphere, particularly in this high southern latitude, which is Antarctica, you see that these data don't really correspond to today's field. They look more like half on average. And you'd expect that as a time average, things behave like a dipole. So what could be the cause of this? Well, this perhaps three possible reasons. There are probably more than that, but I'll identify three. Um, one is that you could have biased paleointensity results. So, you know, you have a lot of data. These, these numbers, I should say, represent the number of data in these bins. So you could have a lot of data, and it's hard to explain why you get such a different result unless perhaps you have some problem with these data that is causing them to be biased high or low at a particular latitude. Um, another reason for this is that you could have different age distributions at different latitudes, so your time average doesn't really represent the same thing. And a third reason is that, well, the field really isn't dipolar over the last five million years, which is when these data come from. And so then you've got to sort of come up with an alternative field that produces this distribution. So. Biased paleointensity results. This is perhaps an unfair example, but this figure I'm showing you are paleointensity results from different methods, from different studies, which are indicated by these different markers here. Um, and this is from a 19, the 1960 lava flow in Hawaii. Uh, and the horizontal line here is the expected paleointensity at this site, which is about 36 microtesla. Um, and we know this because we know what the field was in 1960 in Hawaii. We have measurements of it. And then these are the paleointensity results generated by these different methods. And you can see that you get results from some of these studies that go up to 80 microtesla. And this sort of represents about the range of the Earth's magnetic field on Earth today. So this is, this is not a good result. However, I have chosen here sort of a, a lava flow that is quite pathological um, to show. And I should mention that to the left here, the studies are getting more recent, and this only goes up to 2015. So people have been getting better at this. And one of the things that we do in Liverpool is that we try and get studies where we have different methods that agree with one another. Um, so you know, perhaps improving this a bit. But this is a problem that you can get biased payload intensity results. Another thing I talked about is at time averages and what those really mean. So if we look at this distribution of paleo intensities with latitude, you can see that for the bins that are more populated, um, the distribution of paleo intensities that tend to be give these lower average fields also tend to have older paleo intensities represented. So if you look at these low northern latitude results, you can see that the distribution of paleo intensities in most of these bins with the higher result averages tends to be more skewed towards the recent, uh, especially the last one million years. Whereas in Antarctica, and say at this, uh, I think this is 40 degrees north where things are, oh, actually this one's getting a bit lower, but maybe, yeah, this one, uh, it's skewed towards further in the past. So um, there is sort of a difference in what you're averaging here. And then finally, uh, this is a little bit about what uh, Monica Corto was talking about yesterday. Uh, models of the magnetic field can be built up by summing these progressively more complicated uh, spherical harmonic models. And this is the, an example of what the intensity and field direction, well, vertical field angle, would look like for a dipole, a quadrupole, and an octupole field, which are just different spherical harmonic orders. And studies of these paleo directions find that you need about a few percent of these this quadrupole term on average. But uh, studies of paleo intensities find that instead for this distribution, you, you need about 30% or 15 to 30% of this quadrupole term, which is maybe a bit implausible. So 
you could have a non-dipole field, but how do we how do we really generate something that looks quite quadrupolar? It's hard hard to imagine. So, just to give you sort of a, a brief outline of of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to give you a bit more introduction on how rocks acquire magnetizations and why you might have these biases in paleo intensity data, and then I'm going to talk about these two methods that can be used to analyze paleo intensity data. One is to analyze directions, but it can still be used for paleo intensity data. And then finally, I'm going to talk about an application uh, of these methods to real data that I collected from Hawaii in that picture that I showed you at the start. Um, and that will sort of demonstrate the reasons for coming up with these methods or what we can gain from this. So how do rocks gain a magnetization? Um, well, rocks have sort of lots of little magnetic particles inside them, known as grains. And this is a sort of schematic of a grain that I'm showing here. Um, and these grains will have preferred states in which they prefer to be magnetized. So this is an example of an elongate grain, and it will prefer to be magnetized in one of two states, either in this direction along the elongate axis or in this direction along the elongate axis. And I'm sure Les will not like me for making this really, really simple, but it's an oversimplification, but it's, it's useful. And so if you want a grain to have its state changed from being in this direction to in this direction, you need some energy because it has to rotate through a direction in which it doesn't want to be magnetized. And so normally, the energy that I'm going to be talking about here is thermal energy, which is needed to flip this grain's magnetization state. And then below some temperature, which is known as the blocking temperature, there's not enough energy for these grains to flip between states over geological timescales. And so they're known as blocked. They can't move. And then as you heat a grain up, uh, the opposite is true. So it'll become unblocked at a certain temperature where it's then able to freely flip between these states. Um, and I'm going to show you a little animation of grains doing this. So what you're going to see in this animation is you'll see that this is a this gray box represents a rock. Um, this thermometer represents the te temperature. And you'll see that from sort of a, a lava state or from a high temperature state, you'll see these grains grow. Um, and then at some temperature known as the Curie temperature, they'll become magnetized. And then below that temperature, they'll start, they'll, they'll be flipping and they'll stop flipping at their individual blocking temperatures, which will differ for each of the grains. So this should play. So here, oh, this is going very slowly, but these, okay, this is not working very well, but these should be flipping. You can kind of see them flipping. It's much slower than it should be playing. Um, and then at some temperature, as these cool down, this will be sort of locked in and they'll stop moving. And this differs for each one of these grains. And so unfortunately, probably the next animation that I play you won't work so well either um, with this. Um, but now that they've cooled down, and, and there's a preferential, I should say, there's a preferential alignment with the external field, which is this blue arrow here. Um, and so that preferential alignment, the degree of alignment, is what gives you your field strength. And the direction of the alignment is what gives you your field direction. So when you have an ensemble of many, many of these grains, uh, they will have a proportionality in their magnetization strength to the field strength up to some saturation where they're all as aligned as they can be. So here's my other animation. So the other thing that we can do in paleomagnetism that's very useful is because these grains have different blocking temperatures, we can partially demagnetize a rock by heating in zero field up to a given temperature and then cooling down. And then you remagnetize a population of the grains in a random direction. And you can also partially remagnetize by doing this process in a field. And so that's sort of what I'll show you here. Uh, again, it's kind of slow, so some of these things will start flipping, and you won't see that it's not all of them because the flipping is slower than it should be. And then it cools down, and they get relocked in in a random orientation. And then you do this in a field, and the things that are flipping will be preferentially aligned with that field of the things that get remagnetized. So that's that's what I'm talking about. So then this gives us everything that we need for a paleo intensity experiment. So in a paleo intensity experiment or a Tellier experiment, which is a particular kind of paleo intensity experiment, uh, what happens is we plot our data on this plot here. And so what, what we do is we demagnetize our specimen to a given temperature by 
heating and cooling in zero field, and we record the magnetization remaining on the y-axis here, and that's a demagnetization to a given temperature. Then we do the same thing to the same temperature, in this case 450 degrees, and we remagnetize to this temperature, and we gain a magnetization in the known lab field. And the proportion of the magnetization loss to the magnetization gained should represent the ratio of the ancient field to the lab field. And so that should all plot on a, on a line here. And the slope of that line is the ratio of those two fields. Um, I should say that the different symbols in here represent slightly different orderings of these steps. So you can do in-field first or zero-field first, and that may uh, be important later. But that's how we do a pale intensity experiment. Another type of plot that you'll see is uh, what's known as the Zeideveld plot. And this is just a plot of the vector direction of the magnetization at each of these zero field steps as it gets demagnetized. The two different uh, markers here just re represent a horizontal projection and a vertical projection of the same data. And so you'll start at some low temperature and then demagnetize and trend towards the origin in the line. So we have this way of doing directions and we have this way of doing intensities. It should be a straight line on the RI plot. It should be a straight line on the Zydevel plot. That should all be easy. Okay, what, what is the problem that causes us to get biased paleo intensities? So that remagnetization process I talked about, the first thing that can happen is that that can occur naturally. So say you have you know, a lava flow comes along, cools down in a field, and then another lava flow comes along on top of it and partially reheats the lava flow underneath in a new field. And then you get this remagnetization that is recording a different field at these lower temperatures. And so the sort of diagnostic way that you can see this is you can see that there's potentially a change in direction in the Zydevel plot, which represents the different field. So say the field reversed in between then at a particular temperature, the direction that your Zydevel plot is going to progress in is going to change. And so that's represented here. You've got a straight line going to the origin, but only at temperatures above 200 degrees. And above 200 degrees, you also have a straight line in your RI plot. So this is, this is a fixable problem. This can also happen just naturally because either you have thermal energy that you use to demagnetize or you just wait a long time. And so things that have lower energy barriers to flip after a long enough time at a lower temperature, they can also flip. And so for older rocks, you may also get what's known as a viscous remnant magnetization. Another problem that you can have in a pale intensity experiment is that you're heating iron oxides in an atmosphere <laughs> to a given temperature. And so doing that can cause your iron oxides to undergo oxidation and reduction reactions. And so when you've done that, you effectively make a new material and that new material is not recording the same thing. And so you can't get that normalization constant because it's a new thing. So how we check for this is by doing a repetition of an infield measurement to see after doing a, a higher, uh, after heating to a higher temperature to see if that infield measurement is reproducible. And if it's not, perhaps you've lost or gained some magnetic material. And that's known as a PTRM check. So at this 450 degree step in this example, um, what, you, what we did is we reheated this rock to 400 degrees in a field, and we see that it gains less magnetization at this temperature, which indicates that potentially it's lost some of its magnetic minerals. They've changed into something else. And you can see that the slope of this line changes at this temperature as well, which is kind of indicative that you know, there's a problem. But at temperatures below this, there shouldn't be a problem. So we're looking for something that's a straight line on the RI plot, a straight line on the Zydevel plot over a given range of temperatures. And you know, that should, that should be all right. These two things seem fixable. However, there is a third problem. So, so far, I've talked about these magnetic grains in rocks that have these two minimum energy states that they can flip between. But actually, most things in rocks don't look like this. You can have minimum energy states where there are more than two, and they can flip from one state to an, or change from one state to another, and in that more complex situation, there isn't a given blocking temperature at which your, you know, your rock becomes magnetized and demagnetized. There's sort of a range of state transitions that can go on. And so in things like this that are a lot more complicated, a sort of characteristic um, sort of signature of this, and there's many, but this is one, um, in the RI plot is that you get this curved RI plot that sort of sags downwards. And this is not well physically understood, it's more phenomenologically understood. 
Um, but the problem with this is if you take a linear portion of this RI plot, you can be very wrong because actually the sort of total is closer to the answer, but that too can be biased. So there's not really a good way of getting a result from something that has a curved RA plot like this. But the way that you might deal with your data from those other two problems will give you a wrong answer if you deal with this in the same way. And so it makes things very, very complicated. So how do paleomagnetists deal with these data? What they do is they make an estimate for a sort of unit of things that cooled in the sort of same field, so a single lava flow. They'll take multiple specimens. And then what they'll do is they'll use selection criteria to describe behaviors like this that are ideal or non-ideal. Um, and so they will basically want to accept data that look like this and throw data that look like this out. Um, but this is all based or mostly based on phenomenological descriptions. And there's not really much agreement between labs on which set of selection criteria to use. And it can, it can vary from study to study. Um, and so this is a big problem because then when you compare these paleo intensity data in a global database, how comparable are they really? Well, they've been analyzed using different methodologies. So this can cause a problem. So now I'm going to talk about uh, a method that I came up with for analysis of paleo intensity data during my PhD. Um, and this method is known as, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but basically the, the motivation for this, as I said, selection criteria inconsistent. And if we make them too strict, we end up with no data. And if we make them too loose and exclude too few things, then we end up with these biased results. So is there a better way to do things? So kind of implicitly there, we're saying that of this non-ideal behavior we see, uh, the bias we see in our paleo intensity experiments is a function of this. So why not try to find what that function is? So Greg Patterson uh, here defined a, a, a criterion known as curvature. And basically this describes this sagging behavior that I talked about before. And this curvature is actually correlated with bias in the total TRM or the total magnetization on this RI plot. So in this case, these are a set of specimens that were given a magnetization in a, 50, a 60 microtesla field, excuse me. Um, and then the pale intensity experiment was performed on them. So we know what the answer should be. And the things that have these sort of sagging two slope RI plots give progressively lower paleo intensities, the higher the curvature parameter is. And so if we tried to find a relationship with this, potentially what we could say is we could correct back to the value at zero curvature. Um, so this is the motivation behind what I'm calling the bias corrected estimation of paleo intensity or BICEP method. Um, and sorry, this, this figure has gotten a little bit smaller than it should be. But um, basically what this does is it assumes that there is a linear relationship between the curvature and the bias. And this is something that's, again, phenomenological, but actually it turns out pretty well. So the idea here is that you fit these circles, which is how you define curvature, to your paleo intensity data. And you then come up with, so something that looks like a straight line basically has an, a circle with infinite radius that's fit to it and has a very low curvature. Uh, and something, and it plots here uh, with this sort of zero curvature line, curvature is on the x-axis here and intensity is on the y-axis. And you can see that something that's very curved plots down here has a high curvature on the x-axis and a low intensity on the y-axis. And then something that's very, very scattered uh, there's a lot of different circle fits that you could perform to this. So it has these huge error bars when trying to perform this fit. And then these blue lines are fits that we've run through here. And the red line here is the actual known value for this historical lava flow. And you can see that where the blue lines cross the origin point, the zero curvature point, you end up with an unbiased estimate of the paleo intensity, despite the fact that you've included biased paleo intensities in your analysis. And this means that you don't have to arbitrarily exclude things. They just sort of get downweighted in the estimate of this intercept. So this is good. Um, so the big improvement here is that this makes accurate paleo intensity estimates, and it doesn't require excluding anything, as I just said. Um, but it propagates the, it also propagates these uncertainties that you have about the interpretations that you've made with your specimens up to the site level. So to just give you an example of this, this is something where we excluded the first two data points because they're in a different direction, so they represent a different field, and this would be rejected by the very very strict criteria that 
previously were being used at Scripps Oceanography because not enough of this plot is being used. Um, however, and so there could be a bit of curvature, but this just translates this into an uncertainty in the curvature using these circle fits, and so it works fine. Um, but there are some remaining questions with this method. So it doesn't help us with which range of temperatures to choose. That's something that you still need some sort of criterion to use. And why should this relationship be linear? I've kind of said that this is a phenomenological thing, but there's no motivation for this. And this is something that I hope to look into in the future is to get a motivation for why there would be a linear relationship. Personally, I suspect that the reason that this works the best, I tried some other relationships, is it's just the simplest. And so it just gives you an extra degree of freedom to work with. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit differently about how we solve this problem of which temperatures to choose. Um, and so this is for analysis of thermal demagnetization data. So if you recall, um, there's this problem where you have uh, low temperatures uh, in a pale intensity experiment that don't represent the original field. Um, and you want to choose things that are sort of in a straight line demagnetizing to the origin on the Zydebel plot. And BICEP doesn't give you a way to do this. So there is a, a sort of little wrinkle here as well, which is if you have these grains that cause uh, these problems in your pale intensity experiments, actually in a thermal demagnetization experiment, they can make it quite difficult for understanding what temperature to choose in a pale intensity experiment. So ideally what you'd have is you'd have something, say for example, and this was, this was a rock where I actually gave this a magnetization and then remagnetized it at a lower temperature. So say for example, your rock cools in a given field and it has you know, a given direction, which is in this direction sort of to the left here. Um, and then you go and remagnetize it to 500 degrees-ish and you remagnetize it in a new direction here. And this is what your Zydevel plot should look like. So the temperature that you remagnetized it to forms this corner here in the plot. However, if you have something where you've got these more complicated things that don't have a given blocking temperature, what happens is that your two components that you gave your rock or your two different magnetizations acquired in two different fields demagnetize over a range of temperatures which overlap. And so you end up getting this curve in the Zydervel plot as well. And this is, this is very problematic for choosing your range of temperatures because what temperature do you pick for your straight line going to the origin? Is it 515? Is it 510? You know, what, what temperature does this happen at? It, it's more difficult to determine. So I actually have a little animation of how this can happen. So this is uh, basically the distribution of blocking temperatures in a rock. So that's the temperatures at which those grains flip. And everything up until 375 degrees in this case is acquired in one field. And then everything above this is acquired in another field. And so if the blocking temperatures are all consistent, then what ends up happening is as your temperature increases, oh, this animation's not going to work great. As you cross this barrier, your direction changes. Okay. Um, now, if instead there's some overlap, so your distributions have changed a bit, what ends up happening is in this region, you end up getting a curve. And so that's how, how this is formed. It's just a little animation to demonstrate kind of physically how that works. Um, so I created a model called Thermal Resolution of Unblocking Temperatures, or TROUT for short, because I like acronyms. Um, and so the way that this works is it can be fit to actual Zydevel data, and it uses that kind of um, uh, basically framework that I showed you before of using these unblocking temperature distributions, where you fit these distributions to your two components, and these are then fit, you know, fit to your Zydevel data. And if there's a nice sort of crispy corner between your two components, then it tells you that the temperature is right here with very little overlap. Um, whereas there's significantly more overlap in this case where you have this sort of curved direction. And so this can tell you because you can look at the ratio of these two distributions to see what's unblocking at a particular temperature. And then you can get out of it the range of temperatures where you're only unblocking one thing because you've constrained that overlap. So it's useful in paleo intensity experiments. It's also useful in quite a lot of other situations. I'm not sure how much time I have left. Okay, great. Um, so now we're going to talk about the kind of an application of this method, um, which is from Hawaii. So remember that 
this distribution of latitudes is the sort of problem where, that I outlined at the start of this, this distribution of pale intensities. Why did the pale intensities not uh, behave in the way that we would expect? Um, so question one, biases in the paleo intensity data, I think that we can perhaps solve by using this consistent methodology and not excluding things, but just providing a sort of numerical weighting scheme, which is consistent. Um, and then that should hopefully alleviate some of these problems with biases in the power intensity using BICEP. Um, this problem of different age distributions at different latitudes and this potential real non-dipolar behavior, it would be really nice to get a better handle on this. And so we have all these good data from Antarctica that were measured in the Scripps lab that have this nice distribution of ages. But these data from Hawaii uh, don't have this nice distribution of ages. So this is 20 degrees north, which is about where Hawaii is. So the motivation is then uh, go here and collect some more data from this older period. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And what we did in Hawaii is we collected data from several different types of lithologies. So we went to collect things from, ooh, that went back a couple of slides, collect things from lava flow tops, uh, dike margins, and volcanic vent deposits, so things like scoria. And the reason that we went for those is that these materials are very rapidly cooled, and so they're very fine-grained. And that means that there's less possible magnetization states in those materials. So although they can still thermally alter and have these other problems, that problem of having these sort of multiple magnetization states is less common. Uh, the other reason is that cooling rate can also be a factor in determining the intensity. And so these things have cooling rates similar to our lab cooling rates. So to get a sort of even age distribution, uh, we went to four different Hawaiian islands and we collected things uh, from seven different volcanoes. And so this is a, a little map of our data. It's probably gonna be quite hard to see, but these stars represent successful sites. Um, if you can't see this, don't worry. Basically the interpret the main reason is that we main motivation for this is we enter four different islands to get an even distribution throughout time. And the colors here represent the age of the flows that we're uh, sampling from. So, we then applied the BICEP method. Uh, I didn't get to applying the, um, I, that's not published yet, so I haven't yet gotten to applying the trout method to this, but we used BICEP on these. Um, and we compared it to a previous use set of criteria by Cromwell, which is what was previously being used in the Scripps lab. Um, and something that I just want to say is sort of a main point in this study. I'm not going to get into why this occurs, but I noticed that there's this lab field dependent of the directional data. Um, basically, it depends on the lab field that you use. And this is a problem because it actually depends on the ratio between the lab field and the ancient field, which is the thing that you're trying to find out. And so things that have a much higher lab field than the ancient field, you would preferentially reject. Um, and I'm not going to explain why this happens exactly, because it is quite complicated, but uh, we can avoid this by using multiple fields as a kind of lab protocol and also by analyzing the directions slightly differently to avoid this zigzagging problem. So another finding, just as sort of an aside, is that we looked at some SEM images of our specimens and we found this very interesting texture, uh, which is representative of uh, an alteration or an oxidation of olivine, whereby um, all of the iron basically gets drawn into these oxides. And this is quite well described in the petrological literature. And fortunately, uh, this happens at temperatures well above where these rocks are magnetized. And so the important thing there is that this is still an original thermal magnetization. And the nice thing about this is that it makes these things less likely to oxidize uh, in our actual results, so that's great. Um, and these have very, very high success rates. So I had uh, one site where I measured these and I had a 100% success rate over 16 specimens. And I had another site where I, I measured these and I had a 100% success rate across six specimens. And these are very large numbers for anyone who does paleo intensity. This is kind of shocking. So this is a texture that I think, you know, it's, it's worth looking into some more. Um, but let's talk about the paleo intensity result. So 
BICEP gave us 32 paleo intensity estimates, whereas these previous criteria gave us 21. So we get a lot more estimates with similar sort of quality. Um, and I'm showing here the intensity versus age on this plot. Um, and there is a lot of variation, and that's because the Earth's magnetic field really does vary. This is sort of what you'd expect to see. The different markers here represent different lithologies. I just thought it's worth putting that in there just to see if there is a consistent difference between lithology. There doesn't seem to be at times where ages overlap. And the gray markers here are just data from uh, a different study looking at a, a core of lava flows that are submarine. I just wanted to show that the average that we get at this time is similar to their average, although they have a few more data points uh, it, at this time and they have um, basically a higher variance because of that, but that's not completely unexpected. So what we did differently in this paper is instead of just taking an average throughout this entire time period, because there's not necessarily an even temporal sampling, it depends on the rocks that you get results from, um, what we did is we fit a curve to our data uh, and then took the average of that curve. So we use this method of Livermore and the way that this works is it sort of has an uncertainty in the curve that you fit and that uncertainty envelope, which is rather large at times where you have no data, is reflected in this blue area here, right? And it, it looks huge, but when you take an average and then you look at the distribution of potential averages over a time period of this curve, you get a more reasonable result. Still with large error bars, but it allows you to do some comparisons to other places that don't necessarily have the same temporal distribution. Um, so when we compare this to results from other studies, this is a study from Antarctica, this is a study from Hawaii, and then this is, oh sorry, our study from Hawaii, and then this is data from uh, Israel. Um, we can see that it's a bit of a mess because you have these large uncertainties, and so better temporal sampling would be really nice here, but we don't necessarily have it. But if we look at these sort of average lines, this is, this is just the average of all the data over this time period. Um, we can see that in this sort of more recent period, oh, and I should say this is the virtual axial dipole moment. So if you came to Monica's talk, that's the strength of a dipole that would be expected from a perfectly dipolar field, uh, given the paleo intensity that you got at that latitude. So it's kind of like doing those curves that I showed you in the first plot backwards. It's translating it into a dipole strength. And so if you compare these on a, a consistent scale, you can see that actually in this early time period, the virtual axial dipole moment in Hawaii is about twice that you see of that in Antarctica. And that just comes from the data, that just comes from the points here. And that's also reflected in previous data. So this is just all the data in the database from any, data, from any study without any sort of selection in them. Um, in the gray squares here, the average is very, very similar. Again, the, um, var the variance is slightly higher. Um, and then if you go further back in time, what you see in Hawaii, which is interesting, is that the sort of average takes a little bit of a step down. So here it's about, uh, in microtesla, sorry, it's about 35, and here it's about 25. I'm not exactly sure what that translates to in VADM at the top of my head, probably about 80 to about 60 or something like that. Um, and this seems to happen at about one or one and a half million years, although we don't have very many data here. And that's quite different from the results that you see uh, from older studies at this time, this time, but a lot of these were doing analyses on curved things when I looked into these data sets that are in the study. So there's probably an inconsistency there where they were taking sort of a, partic a part of a slope from a, a curved RI plot, which gives you quite a considerable amount of bias. So then what these sort of distributions here shown are, are basically distributions of the, of the averages of these curves over a particular time scale. And so you can see that for Antarctica over the last sort of, there's, there's sort of some overlap over the last two and a half million years, but over the last one and a half million years, there really isn't any overlap between Hawaii and Antarctica. And so green again being Hawaii, purple being Antarctica and orange being Israel. Although Israel over this time period is, you know, it's fairly uncertain there aren't that many data. Um, and so, What's important about this to note is that it even just gets borne out in the data, even if you don't look at any of these models, uh, you have this much higher field. And so this kind of thinking that it might be a temporal averaging thing, it could be if you're just averaging things like this in Hawaii, but that sort of persistent lower average in Antarctica 
it still seems to be there even during this early or this more recent period. Um, and so, you know, three and a half, uh, sorry, 3.8 million years, which is the time scale that I looked at because it's where I've got the data in Hawaii, might not be enough time to average out this difference over the past sort of 1 million years. So in sort of conclusion of what I did for my PhD, two new methods for avoiding bias pale intensity data. BICEP is bias in pale intensity data. Trout is dealing with the range of temperatures to use. And then we collected this data from Hawaii and we compared it to these two other studies and trying to find out whether it's this temporal averaging on the non-dipole field. And probably there's a little bit of both going on. So you're still sampling this early period, which was higher in Hawaii, and that's why you're getting this higher average. But you don't see this higher average in Antarctica as well. And perhaps this is something to do um, with what Monica was talking yesterday about. Again, it kind of sets me up nicely of this persistent Southern Hemisphere low field feature. Uh, it's possible that this is causing this discrepancy. And so maybe it is a real non-dipolar behavior that causes this. Um, so with that, I just want to say, does anyone have any questions? That's, that's my talk. <laughs> Because um, there's sort of this basic assumption that goes into all plate tectonic reconstructions with directions, and to be fair, for directions, it does seem to work that the Earth's magnetic field is, is a geocentric axial dipole because to get a latitude, you need to say, well, we've got this vertical angle and that corresponds to a particular latitude on average. And normally they use 5 million year bins for that. But then if you look at the paleo intensity data and you do this 5 million year binning at different latitudes, you just don't see this result. So if the field was non-dipolar, any particular time that has real implications for plate tectonic reconstructions because it would render them you know basically wrong <laughs> so um so again it does seem to bear out in the directions but then there's this issue of well are uh, you know what what's why is there that inconsistency you know it's it's disturbing for those so that's yeah that's that's a big problem that's an assumption that goes into do you have something to add to that Oh, yes. Yeah. So the question, the question for that was, why would it be a problem if the Earth's magnetic field was not a geocentric axial dipole? Um, just to let people know. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's from the last five million years. Yes. So the question was, uh, what was that plot at the start with the sort of distributions of pale intensities with latitude? What age was that? And I said, yes, it is the last 5 million years. Uh, I have not uh, gone further back than that. Um, part of the reason for that is the focus on Hawaii for this study, which you don't really have much data that's older than 5 million years, so you wouldn't be able to do a comparison. Um, and that's generally a problem in the database is that, you know, that the reason that you have those age distributions is because those are the rocks that are there. Um, I think this is something that Yael has, has worked on. So she, she's looked at sort of Miocene uh, geomagnetic fields. Um, and I think that would be, I mean, the, the goal is to extend it as far back as you possibly can. But also the other problem is that, you know, there's this sort of logarithmic increase in the number of data that you have the closer you get to the present so I, I suspect if you looked in a database and looked at results during the miocene you'd have even sparser things and it would be even harder to get a good time average yeah so so, so yes, uh, the question was how much work would it be to go into the Antarctic data set? I should actually say all of the data in these three figures are compared using the exact same methodology. So that, that's something that to, to reduce this issue of bias pale intensities, you know, you're comparing these global data sets that are really done using different methods. So I want to say, does this persist if everything's treated in exactly the same way? So they, they all use uh, BICEP and they all use um, 
uh, basically the same analysis and the same limited criteria that I used for the directional stuff um, for all three of these studies. And so there really shouldn't be any difference that's in, induced by methodology or by um, criteria or anything like that. They're totally consistent and you still see this, which is, you know, it, it seems to be robust. And to be fair, in Hawaii, you still see it at this time, whether you exclude things or not, it seems to be quite a robust average. So yeah, what sort of whatever methodology you take to look at it, it, it stays. Um, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, I know that perhaps it's difficult to link the experiments directly to a lot of questions of complexity or input. But what's the understanding at the microphysical level of the magnetic equation of where two different shapes are? Yeah. You know, you okay. You know, this is an easy shape, that's a beautiful shape. How does that translate into how that microphysical behavior influences? So this is a great question because this is exactly what I'm going to be doing here. Um, so yeah, so there is an entire field. Oh yes, yeah, so the question, again, thank you. The question was, uh, how does uh, sort of understanding of grain magnetization translate something that you can look at in a microscope to something that you get in a paleomagnetic experiment? Um, and that's basically the entire project that I'm going to be working on my postdoc here. So or a big part of it, is that there's a whole field known as micromagnetic modeling, which is an energy minimization um, framework for uh, taking a grain geometry uh, and material and temperature and then modeling what the energy minima are and what the barriers are between those. Um, and so with that, then what you could do is, in theory, if you had some simple geometries, you could take those, calculate energy barriers, and simulate an experiment based on what you see in a microscope image. And so that could directly tie your sort of what you've got in your rock to something that you see in the experiment. But currently, that's not been done because it's a very, very computationally exper expensive problem. And so sort of the first thing that I'm working on here is to get a lot of those models run so we have those energy barriers calculated so we can start doing some Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and then we're going to try and apply that to some much older rocks. Um, yes, yeah. Um, can, Okay, yeah, I might have to exit this and see what the Zoom question is. If you if you could read it, it might be easier, uh, just because. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes, so this is this is a very good question. Um, I yeah, so it it kind of depends what temperature that we're talking about and what time. So so the temperature time relationship it follows kind of an Arrhenius law. So it's it's exponential. So um, if it's there for um, an instantaneous amount of time, all grains that would demagnetize up to that temperature that are at that temperature will be effectively remagnetized over that time scale. If it's sitting there for a week at that temperature, then in the lab, you'll see an effect on things that go to higher temperatures um, because it's, you know, it's basically a, a conversion of temperature, the temperature time relationship. So effectively, yeah, it is instantaneous. And when we remagnetize rocks in the lab, we do it for like 30, 45 minutes held at the temperature. I think that varies from lab to lab, but that translates into a blocking, you know, a particular blocking temperature, but something that's sitting there for two weeks, it'll translate to a, a higher blocking temperature. And it, it does depend on the cooling rate as well, but this is something that can be empirically corrected for. Um, I don't know if that's uh, helpful, but yeah, it's, it's useful to think about the thermal modeling. Yeah, I've uh, got a couple more questions. So, 
Yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, so the question was, uh, why not sample from the bottom of the lava flow rather than the top? I said lava flow tops. Actually, a lot of what we sampled were bottoms of lava flows as well, which are, which are rapidly cooling. Um, most of the lava flow tops that were sampled did not have another lava flow that was there going over the top. Uh, that could, of course, have since been eroded away, but if there was that erosion, you probably wouldn't have that much fresh fine grain material. Um, and so the argument is that generally when we're sampling these lava flow tops, you're sampling things that haven't been overridden by something really, really close, or it's to a low enough temperature that it's, it's far enough away that it's to a low enough temperature that it's probably not going to cause a problem because it's not going to completely reset. As long as you still have some of the magnetization remaining that you can kind of tell that you've not got a curved RI plot, then you can still get something out of it. Um, there was another question. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know how far you can push those analogies, whether they can be of any help in this situation. The whole, the ideas of blocking and resetting and these sorts of things overlap. Is there anything you could learn from that literature or in some of it? Is there any way you could actually sort of provide new, new methodologies? So yeah, uh, the question was uh, the concept of uh, blocking temperatures and overlap um, contribute to or, or are seen in, in geochronology as well um, and is there something that you know could be contributed by sort of a, a maybe something that's you know cooperative between these sort of two fields um, uh, I have not thought about that at all so <laughs> you yes yeah. So Courtney Sprain would be yeah a good a good person to talk to about this. No, this is that's something that I've not particularly thought about. And I mean, both are important in these cases because all of these data have some geochronology atta attached to them. They're predominantly argon argon dates. Um, and so yeah, there's there's uh, you know some some similar things going on. Um, yeah. No, it, it's something it's something I really haven't thought about. Um, aside from the fact that the mineralogy that you might want to use for your argon argon dating is not necessarily the same thing that you want to do in your paleo intensity study. So, for example, sampling the margins of these dikes, um, that's not something that you're really going to want for an argon argon date because I think that you you might get some some trapped gases in there. Um, whereas we, we so basically what we did is we took some interior samples for the argon argon dating. I know that doesn't that's not necessarily what your question was, but yeah, I, I I I'm not sure to be honest with you. I've not thought too much about the analogies in geochronology, but that's perhaps something that should be looked into. Um, yeah, Elliot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So Elliot, I don't know if that was caught, but Elliot said that just kind of had a an addendum to what I said about thirty five forty, sorry thirty forty five minute hold times in the lab. Some of the methodologies are instantaneous uh, or that are used in the lab. Some of the lab protocols is seconds, and so that yeah would would basically be instantaneous but yeah i think that's yeah uh in a, in a pale intensity experiment the the sort of salient thing there is that you whatever energy is input in the zero field step has to be the same in the infield step that's the really key important thing so blocking temperatures are relative depending on time but as long as they're consistent between your two lab steps it's okay and then you can use a scaling relationship to translate a blocking temperature at a particular time to a blocking temperature on another time scale. Although for non-single domain grains, that relationship might be a bit more complicated as well. But that's something again that we can solve with this micromagnetic modeling. So 
I think that offers an opportunity for a lot of things. Any more questions? Okay, so uh, 